This is the Wealth Standard Radio, your gold standard in everything financial. How's it going, everyone? This is uh, this is Patrick Donahoe, and you're listening to the Wealth Standard Radio. And uh, we are we're winging it today. I'm I'm actually on vacation, and uh, I've I've tried to get technology together to pull this thing off. So we'll see uh, we'll see if it happens. And we're going to talk about uh, a topic that I really hesitate in even announcing because uh, it might seem cumbersome. But uh, my good friend Brian McCloskey, who's right here with me, uh, we're going to we're going to make it interesting, right? And uh, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about, uh, talk about negative interest rates. So Brian, how's it going, man? Good, Patrick. Man, I'm excited to be here. I'm I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. I'm, I'm a few I'm a few minutes late. Well, more than a few minutes late, but you know. We do what we got to do. Hey, uh, you know, the Fed, the Fed is more than a couple minutes late in terms of uh, straightening this country out. So seriously, they don't understand time. Fed doesn't <laughs> understand time. Most central banks understand time. They don't understand interest rates either, apparently. <laughs> uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Good old NERP, as uh, as you've probably seen it in uh, you know on the web and in various articles. Yeah, and that's the thing is you know you, we we get we often get feedback in regards to. You know what? What people are concerned with? What are their challenges? What are they facing as far as the economy is concerned? Uh, what are their anxieties? You know, what can they do to position themselves to either protect their wealth or, uh, or perhaps grow it? So it's a question we oftentimes get. But you know, we're we, we're always diving into these kind of deep topics, and you know, at the end of the day, you know, we uh, we, we we try to understand what's going on, but really being able to predict the future, the future, you know, that's that's. Uh, I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure if that's that's possible. But I know la- last time that you were in the office, because uh, you you work out of uh, Philadelphia. But last time you were in the office, you know, I challenged you to go and do some research in regards to negative interest rate policy and and kind of deep dive into that, just to get a better understanding of what some of the uh, the terms are, what some of the theories are, uh, what's being predicted as far as what's coming down the pipe, because the Fed is running out of options. This is you know still one of those tools in their shed or arrows in their quiver. So who knows what's going to happen? But let's kind of, you know, why don't, why don't you give me an idea of, you know, what you found with your, uh, with your research and, you know, what, what are some of the conclusions you came to? Yeah, and it's interesting, Pat, that um, that is how it came about because effectively, you know, we have conversations with clients all over the country and, and uh, whether they're about to become clients or have become clients of ours, you know, we talk money all the time. We talk what's going on in the country all the time. We talk taxes all the time. And it, it, just a few years ago, I remember it was all zero interest rates. What's that going to do? Zero interest rates. And or then now it's just interest rates. Or low interest rates, right, prolonged low interest rates. And now, you know, I saw a Warren Buffett quote just the other day that said, you can read from all these different economists, but you can't find a word about prolonged, not even just zero interest rates, but negative interest rates. And even the Oracle himself is saying, you know, that's a phenomenon no one even thought would happen. And it's almost like you're, you kind of mentioned it's an arrow in, in the, um, each central bank's, because that's actually what, what's driving it. That's what I found was, you know, it's an arrow in each central bank's quiver that, you know, they never thought they'd have to go to. But you know what? It's almost like that little button that's underneath the, the canister, a little red button on the, on the tabletop. And they're like, you know what? If we have to press that, we will. It's the red and phone. Really, it's the red phone. It's that it's, that's right. red phone. You, know, I, I th- you, weren't, you weren't there with us, but we took a tour of the Federal Reserve in, uh, in Salt Lake. And they had us hang like our, you know, hang or hang our coats because it's during the winter time. But they had us hang our coats there as we were giving the tour. And there was this red phone. You know, there's like three black phones. There's this red phone. It was like one of those, you know, those dial like rotary type of phones. So I was like, what that? What's that for? They didn't answer the question. But. <laughs> it's the negative interest rate phone. Negative interest rate phone. It's like that's when that's when is the fan was when those phones start to. That start the ring. <laughs> American, Americans aren't spending enough. Do it, Do right? It. So <laughs> call, call the red one. So. It's, but it's really interesting. So as I dove into it, it's funny because I said, you know, Pat, it's, it's funny because you threw the ball back to me because I was like, Pat, why don't you do a podcast on this? She's like, Brad, why don't you do some homework? And I was like, all right. So we went back and forth about it. And, um, you know, it's, it find, it, what I'm finding out is really incredible. And it's uh, one of the most incredible uh, things that I found was that this is not the first time we've experienced this, number one. Um, and number two, we are certainly definitely not the first country that's contemplating it because there's several countries right now that are actively doing it. You know, Japan is one of them. Uh, Sweden and Scan- Sweden and uh, Switzerland are some other ones. But uh, interestingly enough, even Denmark started it uh, negative interest rates four years ago. Um, and the first experiment was back in the 70s yep. for a few years. So maybe, it's yeah. So maybe let's maybe re- rewind just so we kind of start. Because I know our listeners uh, 
they, they vary from very sophisticated, they understand economics, they understand monetary policy, but there's some that, you know, are like a negative interest rates, like they don't even know where to kind of start to rationalize what, what that means. So maybe let's take, let's take a, you know, just a second and review, okay, what, you know, what is, what is this, what is negative interest rate policy? What are, um, you know, w what is it? And, you know, why, why is it used? Maybe we'll start there and then we can maybe start about, talk, talk about repercussions. Sure, sure. Yeah, let's actually start there. What are the goals? Why would, why would a bank want to impart negative interest rates? Well, you know, ideally the, the goal is to, if, think about it, you put your, think, Patrick, you, you and I remember, you know, when we were growing up and a lot of clients remember, you used to have a savings account in a bank, you used to get three, four, five, whatever percent interest rate. Yep. You were incentivized to save. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the reasons why we were incentivized to save is because if, if our clients understand fractional reserve lending at all, you know, when we put our money in a bank, the bank pays us a couple dollars because they can go out and make a lot with our money in the form of loans. Mm -hmm. Well, over time, what they found was that if, if, and this is why how we got to zero interest rates, you know, if, when they needed, when the Fed wanted to stimulate the economy, you know, to drive revenue, to, to increase the ability to tax, things like that, they said, well, with all this stagnant money sitting in banks, what do we have to do? We have to try to drive down interest rates to um, disincentivize saving, mm -hmm. effectively, is what it is. And if you think about it, we've been at zero interest rates in the banks for the past, you know, a little over five to eight years or so. And what they're finding is that, well, that's not stimulating our economy enough, so let's disincentivize people even more. So try to wrap your head around this. You will have to, now we don't have to do this yet, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but imagine having to pay to keep your money at a bank. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's effective. And, and that's where it goes. So, let's, so let, me, let me just, because that was a great, great description. So just kind of to, to, to maybe summarize it. So in, interest rates in a, in a free market are to really do uh, two things, right? They're to discourage savings and incentivize spending, right, or to um, encourage, uh, you know, to encourage saving and disincentivize spending, right? So when you have interest rates that are super high, that's when people want to save because they're going to get a return on their money. When interest rates are really low, people are not incentivized to keep their money there. They're incentivized to, to spend it on something because they're not going to earn as much. So that's kind of the free market idea in regards to interest rates. To, and, and that's the thing is most people realize that or don't realize that uh, the, the you know, central banks like the Federal Reserve or uh, you know, U.S. monetary policy to a degree, you know, it hasn't always existed. Okay, interest rates, if you really look at the history of interest rates, right, interest rates were a natural phenomena in regards to just uh, saving and, and lending, right, where basically savers who didn't need to spend money were willing to lend it out to other people, right, in exchange for an interest rate. And those people didn't necessarily, you know, want to save and therefore they paid for the use of that money, right? And that used to happen kind of on an open market, free market idea. But now as we're this, you know, global, you know, cluster, right, if you will, it, you know, we're, we're at this point where, you know, central monetary, central banks and their monetary policy has really kind of taken over as far as setting interest rates. So as far as banks are concerned, you might say, okay, well, how, how do, you know, how do, how does the, what does the Federal Reserve have to do with, with banks, right? Well, basically the Federal Reserve sets the overnight lending rates uh, they set discount the discount rates. So they set the federal fund rate, which is basically the overnight rates. They set the discount rate, which is the rate at which banks will borrow directly from the Fed, right? And and but also what they do is they uh, they can fluctuate mon uh, money supply, right? And that's really where they have a lot of different levers that they can pull, okay, manipulating the interest yield curve, right? I'm not going to get into to all of that. So the idea behind you know this negative interest rate policy it's twofold. Right. First thing, as you said, Brian, it's really where, you know, banks, you can't go, you know, you, you have zero, zero interest rates. And if nobody's willing to spend right on zero interest rates, then it's kind of like, OK, well, what do you do now that you like penalize them for keeping money there? Right. So really, you know, that is OK. It, you know, how far are you going to go? How far are you going to penalize before people start to spend? And we're going to we're going to get into cash in just a second. But the other thing is with bonds. Right. You look at like and, you know, some of and this is this goes to, you know, from an individual standpoint, you know, it's your it's your savings account. Right. But if you look at like institutional investors, uh, if you look at sovereign wealth funds, like where countries put their money right now. Right. They don't want to invest. They don't want to spend. They, they don't want to put money anywhere 
right? And they are willing to put money into bonds, right? And pay a price for bonds that is greater than the yield that coupon rate is on the bond, right? So right now people are not willing to spend any money and therefore they're willing to take a loss, a small loss on it, as opposed to taking a risk, okay, for an even greater loss if they invest it, right? So it's just a, it's a fascinating place that we're in right now where it's like the federal, you know, the monetary bonds, they're like begging us. They're like, please spend money. And what, is, what does that do? That creates the velocity effect. And really, you know, the whole Keynesian idea behind monetary policy is aggregate demand. They are trying to do whatever it takes to increase demand, right? Increase demand for whatever, you know, just spending in general, going on vacation, buying a car, you know, buying technology, uh, buying a house. Buy They're just like, spend, 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 please spend, because they always want this, you know, 2 to 3% growth, right? So that's kind of like the summary of, of you know, what, what they're trying to do. And they're trying to do it, you know, you can listen to our past podcast because we talk about this quite often. But what they're trying to do is, you know, they don't want a loss, right? They don't want depreciation, right? Or sorry, not depreciation, deflation. They, they don't want prices going down, right? So now, so that, that kind of summarizes, you know, this whole idea behind interest rates and, and negative interest rate policy. So Brian, I mean, looking at you know Japan, so Japan's gotten away with it for a long time, right? They've had interest rates, negative interest rate for you know for, for quite for quite some time. So other countries as well have have done it in the past. So ha has there ever you know in your research has there ever been an instance in where it's it's actually worked? It's uh, it's what a great question because it's actually counterproductive right now over in Japan. Yeah. Um, even though they say this hasn't happened in other countries, uh, you know, you've probably seen reports since the beginning of the year that when they implemented it, because they threatened it for a while and Japan's been having a lot of challenges, uh, when they implemented negative interest rates, uh, you know, what they're trying to do is, like we talked about, is stimulate spending. Take the money out of the bank and spend it. Well, what folks were doing was taking the money out of the bank and hoarding it in their house. Actually, they ran out of safe sales. They were selling safes left and right. Um, which was really counterproductive, and uh, you know, I, I have a feeling that that the, the Fed is looking over at Japan and kind of saying, "Well, we don't want to go that direction." Um, interestingly enough, in the opposite direction, one of the longest experiments right now is Denmark, and uh, I was doing some more reading on this today, Pat. Uh, Denmark is actually you, you're paying to save your money, and some folks are actually getting paid on variable rate mortgages on their primary residence. Now think about that. So, so we haven't had the, it's interesting, that country is just going in a very challenging direction, but folks actually have negative interest rates on their primary residence mortgages on a variable loan. And what it's doing is it's causing, causing home prices to go through the roof. And, and, yeah. and some people have actually been, now it's not everybody, but some people are getting credited back mortgage on their, their home loans. But what it's, now think about the unintended consequence. What it's setting up for, we went through 10, 12 years ago yeah. when variable interest rates reset and then people couldn't pay, yeah. right? So you, you see an interesting little world over there in Denmark that I'm sure is being watched as well because for some dumb reason they're not, uh, they're not hoarding the cash there, but they're, they're, they're trying to push it into real estate, it sounds And that's like. the, you know, in some of the articles, you know, as you sent me your research and kind of show me what you're doing, the, the articles were that, you know, the, essentially the, the government could pull off negative interest rate policy uh, successfully if the cash didn't exist, right? So, so let's talk about that for a second, right? Yeah, so if go. you look at, you know, if you look at cash, what, what is cash? I mean, cash is a medium medium of exchange, right? But it doesn't receive any interest and you're not paid any, you're not, you're not paid any interest on it and you'll pay to have it, right? But if you really look at, you know, some of the, I don't know, these, these, these capital controls that we, because we still have some capital controls on us, right? Even though we, you know, it's not called that. I mean, go try and take out, you know, five grand from a bank, right? Go try to withdraw more than 500 bucks in cash per day from the ATM, right? Yep. It, it's in one of the, it's one of those things where, okay, yeah, there, there's not necessarily uh, capital controls, I guess. Not, that's not what it's called, but still there are a lot of stipulations in which you can't go and get large hordes of cash, right? Because back in the day, you know, what did, if, if, if the government tried to pull something off like this, what ended up, what ended up happening? 
people are like, screw that. I'm not paying money to do that. I'm hiding it in my mattress, right? And, and they don't have to pay anything to, to do that. Now, right, can they, can they do that? All their money? I don't know. I mean, looking at, you know, 100 grand in a 401k, $10,000 in a, in a bank account, um, you know, maybe $50,000 in an IRA. You want to go try to liquidate that? It's like you got to pay taxes. You got to pay penalties. You know, most retirement accounts, you can't liquidate. And then you look at cash, right? Banks, you know, they, they are not used to giving you cash. And it's kind of like, and I've heard in a number of instances in, in which they, you know, people have tried to do this, but they go to the bank and they can't get, ca they can't get cash. Or at least yeah. they have to wait a couple days or they have to get permission to do it. It's, cra it's crazy, right? So even though, you know, the, the idea of negative interest rate policy, right now, you know, they don't have absolute, you know, control to be able to, to do that because, you know, the people are only going to take so much. They're not going to go out and, you know, pay, pay to keep money in a, in a bank, right? And it depends on how much they're going to get charged, but really they're trying to, you know, force people, force their hand to actually spend money as opposed to save it. But in the end, forcing people has never resulted in anything, in anything good. And it hasn't happened no. in Denmark, Japan. I mean, there's a number of countries that it hasn't, hasn't worked in and they, they're trying to force it, force it here just for the sake of having positive, positive growth and positive prices. Yep, and I'll even take it a, a, a slightly, I'll, I'll run down the same paths as parallel to what you're talking about there, Pat. You know, for a lot of our clients who, and listeners who understand, again, the, the way banks work, and, and to your point, like you were just saying, you can't walk in there and ask for a $20,000 withdrawal from your account. They'll tell you to come back a couple days later, you know, because they're, they're doing background checks on you and they're, they're pulling the money from different places and all that stuff. But, it, but the bottom line is they don't have all the money in their vaults that they say they have as well. So one thing that I've been reading a lot about is that, you know, if, if negative interest, and this is already happening over in Europe, if negative interest rates do actually show up on American soil, they're most likely going to be contained to the larger institutional or big commercial borrowers anyway. And here's why. Because one of the things that, and Janet Yellen has specifically said this, she does not want to cause a run on a bank. And a run on a bank can close a door and cause some hysteria, and then you have more runs on banks, and that can be a problem. Um, so one of the things they're talking about is only in, uh, imparting it on certain customers, first and foremost. But then secondly, if the banks themselves are being charged, listen, most businesses, when they're taxed more, does it get trickled down through? Like, does it trickle down to the customer? When, when, when they have to pay more for fuel, does it trickle down to the customer? Well, when a bank starts having to pay more interest for the, loan, for the money it wants to pull to, to loan the customers, and it starts having to pay more for that, it's going to trickle down to the customer somehow, right? So we're going to, you know, if it, it always does. It always does. So we're, it's going to trickle down in some capacity if and when uh, the government decides to start doing that. So you have to start thinking about, you know, what you're talking about, some options, holding cash, going in a different direction. Yep. Well, here's the thing. It's kind of like, you know, they're, they're trying to fuel this fire, right, where it's like in the kindling, and it's like so damn wet that you, they're trying to you know, do everything possible to ignite it. And I don't think, in my, in my opinion, I mean, we're, we're at the point where, I don't know, dude, I, we're at the point where so, something's get, something, has to, something has to happen. There has to be some sort of, of correction because you, know, you, you really look at them trying to fuel something that's just not happening. I mean, they've been trying it for you know, since 2009, 2010, and it hasn't, it hasn't worked. And really what it's doing, and maybe in, and my thing is, you know, I take it, I don't want to, I don't mean to be nefarious with what I'm about to say, but, you know, I look at, I look at two, two things. Either they're completely ignorant and they have no idea what they're doing, right? Or they know exactly what they're doing. They're trying to cause a definite outcome. Because if you really look at pushing people to make investment, to start, to start spending, right? There is so much collateral damage behind it, right? Because you're creating false signals and, you know, essentially you're leading people down to exactly what happened in 2008 and 2009, but at a much, at much higher, higher level. Uh, because now you're pushing up asset prices like uh, the stock market. You're pushing asset prices up like, like the real estate market in a sense. You're pushing up automobile asset prices. You're pushing up, you know, really all of that is artificial, right? Because there's it, there's money that exists that did not come into existence because of production. It came into existence because essentially, when the economy was on the brink of actually making a correction, okay, getting rid of bad assets, getting rid of toxic debt, getting rid of all that crap, 
the government basically said, we don't want deflation, therefore we are going to shore up those, those losses and prevent it from happening. And that's what's going on right now is now we're paying, essentially we're on the brink of paying the price for, for what's happening. So at this point, it's kind of like I, I, I my hope is that they're, they want some end because we're not the only central bank that's in this situation, right? Everybody around the world is, is essentially tied to the dollar. They're tied to our economy. And we're at the point where, you know, something is something's going to happen. So now, you know, as we've kind of like scared people a little bit because you know, most <laughs> people sorry. are, and you know what, I, I don't know, it, will they pull the trigger on negative interest rates? Who knows, right? I, 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 don't, I don't know, but unemployment isn't getting better, right? People aren't getting wealthier. People are getting more miserable. Uh, you know, you, you look at what's going to happen with the election and you know, so many different things can shift there. But I would say that we are in a fragile situation, right? People are on, on, on edge. Right. The fuse has just been burning and burning and burning. And it's kind of like lost right in, you know, where you can't see it anymore. And who knows when it's going to pop. But right. I think people, you know, they're they they're, they look at the stock market. They look, you know, all this cash hoarding okay, is representative of people are just like, I'm I, you know, I, I am afraid I don't want to invest. I don't want to you know, I don't want to spend because I learned my lesson, you know, eight years ago. Right. I don't want to make that same mistake. And plus, you have the majority of people that. You know, have money in the stock market. They are, you know, they they are wanting to retire, right? They are wanting to. Uh, they're they're trying to figure out how to grow as much, save as much money as possible to not spend in order to to retire. But they're not quite there yet. And you know, the mentality that exists because it's you know kind of just it's been stretched. So people have been stretched so thin. When it comes down to any type of correction, even a small correction, that could create the tipping point effect, right? Where the slope is so slippery where it's like slip, little slip, little slip, boom, sell off, right? And people are like, I'm out because I'd rather be in cash than lose any more. And that's just the nature of a, of a crash. Because in the end, you know, can you force people to not sell securities, not st- sell savings holdings? I don't, I don't, I, you, I guess you can put preventative measures in there, right? So people won't do that. But it's like, how long can you control human behavior where it's just going to come home to, to roost? And that's where we're at right now. And, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, when it's going to happen. People have been calling it for a long time. But, you know, this artificial stimulation, you know, it's, you inject caffeine into a person so long, it's only going to have so much of an impact, right? The more you put in, the less effect it's going to have. And I think that's where we're at. So, you know, in regards to maybe the opinions that are out there, what, what, what are some of the opinions as far as, okay, what is, uh, you know, wh- what's going to be the, the results of this? What's going to be the collateral damage? I'm sure there's mul- multiple opinions. Yeah, stuff, some of the stuff I've read, and that was a great, that was a great summary right there. Um, some of the stuff I've read is, um, you know, in theory, in theory, if, the, if it works in the U.S., in theory, you know, it's going to reduce borrowing costs because it's going to drive bar- lending interest rates down and uh, drive an increase in loans, you know, in theory. Now, theory doesn't always occur, as we've talked about up to this point. Now, in practice, you know, it, they're saying that, you know, people might hoard cash like you're talking about, and um, maybe that will actually slow down how fast we get into that cashless society like you're talking about. So, so you're right. It could actually be, you know, causing some drag towards maybe a direction that the Fed wants to go in. You know, you kind of hinted at the cashless side there. Um, but there was a third quote that I saw, and you know it had everything to do with these these policy these policy levers that they've been pulling up to this point, and um, it was really interesting because it kind of highlights what you were mentioning a few seconds ago. These negative interest rates, where we're we're you know exploring for essentially the first time in America, and, and especially if it's prolonged, um, it's either going to mark the start of a new era, which you're saying could be a direction that there are some higher powers that want to take us, um, not to be conspired tutorialist there. Um, but it could, it could mark the start of a, a new era, um, or it could finally expose the limitation of, of the powers that, that, that monetary policy has. You know, so it's going to be interesting. We don't know, but the, problem, the bottom line is, even the quotes that I'm sharing with you, it's, it's, all, it's all speculation because you look over one ocean and certain things are happening. You look over the other ocean, different things are happening. Yep. And then you have the human behavior factor, which is, you know, people are flooding their money out of banks into bonds, and that's causing the bond rates to go down. So, you know, it's, it's really interesting. That's where you kind of you circle back to some of the things we talk about with clients all the day, about every day, about, 
you know, just different ideas on where to hold cash, how to think strategically, and how to, uh, you know, have your eyes wide open to some of the things that are going on and the directions we're being shepherded as an American public that may not be in our best interest. Yep. And you know, and that's that's really what you can hope, what you can put your you know put your money on is having a place where you do have the cash, you have liquidity, you have access to it, where you have the least amount of controls as, as possible. Because in banks, you have controls, right? In you know uh, retirement accounts, you also have have controls. Um, with securities, you have controls, right? So and that's that's the thing is even when people realize, okay, stock stocks. When you when you own when you own a stock, right? There has to be a buyer of that stock, right? If you're trying to sell, 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 there may not be a buyer, right? There might be a fund that you own, and there might not be a buyer for it when you're trying to un unload it, right? So when the time comes where it's basically like crap, I need to get out. Doesn't mean you're going to be able to get out, okay? And and that's the thing is, you know, whether you want to get out to preserve uh, principal or to you know uh, mitigate your losses. Or you want to get out because you want liquidity. You you have an opportunity. You have a business. You you can buy a a, a property at fifty percent of its value or whatever. Can can you really do that? Do you have a comment there? I saw you wave, waved your hand about. Yeah, I was just saying one second. You, you used the word controls several times earlier in the uh, podcast, and even right there where you were saying it, I just wanted to make sure the listeners don't misinterpret you as saying you have control when you have those things, because what you're actually yeah. referring to there is considerations or variables that most people don't think about when they when they have their money tied up in an individual stock or a mutual fund, like you're saying, like it's not as liquid as you think. No. Yeah, that, that's why yeah, thank you for clarifying that because you're you're right. It's you know, you don't have control. There are controls on you. <laughs> they're, right, that's they're, that's they're more preventing like they're preventing you know there's a lot of you know kind of things that 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 whether it's uh, broker dealers or um, you know, retirement plan stipulations or or bank stipulations where they prevent runs, right? They prevent a, a host of people being able to go and and liquidate at the same time, which causes panic and chaos, right? There's a lot of things that they've put into place that, that mitigate that, whether it's shutting down markets, right? Whether it's putting penalties on it, right? Whether it's putting on, you know, being able to, to withdraw certain certain amounts. So anyway, I think when it again, what we're trying to say is, who knows what's going to happen, but something's going to happen. And the best position, oftentimes, is you know the position where you can take advantage of of opportunity. And you know, really, the and I'm gonna, I've, I've thought of another guest I'm gonna have on. That I think will give a, a better, a not, not a better angle, another completely different angle um, on on monetary policy. So I might do him in the next uh, next couple weeks. His name is uh, Matt Kirkhoff, and he he's a smart dude, really smart guy, and he has this kind of like ant. This, this totally different angle on, on on how monetary policy works, and it's kind of contrary to us. I think that'd be good to have him kind of combat this, combat this theory. Because the thing with me is like I don't I don't care about being right or being wrong. I I just want to know what's right, right. And I think you know having two different opinions sometimes will will help in that regard. But in the end, I think you know these are definitely signs that you should be you should be aware of. People should be aware of because what it does is it shows you that there is. There are, are variables out there that could lead to disruption. They could lead to emotional type of you know uh, chaos or people acting emotionally, which ends up you know making bad decisions. And you know really for opportunity and building wealth, it's it's to see the forest for the trees and to really see the opportunity amidst amidst the chaos because it's all it's always there. And so looking at you know what we do, it's really having a liquidity, being able to use that so when you know, opportunities do present themselves that are logical, and you understand them, and you know what to do with them. You can match your wealth and your capital with that, and then be better on on the other side. And that's kind of what we're trying to say is that you know, understanding negative interest rate policy. It, the the thing I really want to everyone to understand is that you have a a a, a policy by the U.S. and really the world, which is just not working, but yet they're trying to Force it to work, right? And and maybe they'll make it work. I don't I don't know. Maybe they'll make it work. Um, but they've been trying it and forcing it. They've had multiple QEs. They've had um, you know insanely low interest rates, lowering borrowing standards. Uh, it, it keeps they keep trying all these different things, and it's not working. But yet they're trying to do the same thing. So that is really where it's 
th that for me is like, wow, you need to keep your eyes open, right, for opportunities. You need to keep your eyes open for something happening here and something happening here because when it happens, you can be, you know, on the other side of that transaction. And, you know, these days it's, you know, listening to the election and listening to politicians and listening to commercials. There's so much, you know, stimuli. There's so much information that's out there that's flowing through your eyes and into your brain. Okay, start to, to have some filters on and really look at, again, the forest for the trees. Look at really where the opportunities lie within the chaos. And if you're able to do that, if you're able to put your lenses on, you're going to be able to get great, great opportunities, great rates of return. It's worth, it's worth the rate. Uh, worth the wait because right now, and I'm not sure if you're seeing this, Brian, but I think right now people are they 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 want they, they want to build wealth, right? And this is really in the entrepreneurial space. They want to build wealth. They want to get better. They want to be you know they want to uh, prosper and and they just continue to do and do and act and have certain behaviors uh, that are really agnostic to what's going on in the economy. And I think that's dangerous because right now. If you're, you know, heavily into real estate, if you're heavily into lending, if you're that, you're you're doing it at a very volatile time, and so really thinking through transactions. Not to say that you shouldn't invest, not to say you shouldn't put money in real estate, but you should really think about what you're doing and what will happen to that deal, this deal, this property, uh, this opportunity. Okay, if there is disruption, right? So that's that's really. You know, part of the things I've been trying to explain to our guys as well as our our, uh, our clients is that you know right now is a volatile time, and really you know taking a step back and seeing the big picture is is probably a smarter thing to do, just given you know what's what's been going on with monetary policy, election cycles, and so forth. Yeah, I love the fact that we're having these type of conversations with clients, and like you said, Patrick, I mean you summarize what we do just as a company in terms of. You know, helping helping folks open up their eyes. You know, I I love I love when when clients can start to think more critically, and they come to the table and they're asking questions like this. And it, you know, they might be asking from a position of, hey, I just read about it in the newspaper. Or, how does this affect me? Or how does this affect what we're talking about? But then we can go deeper and really say, you know, we have to look across the, the spectrum and make sure that you recognize. And when I say spectrum, I'm talking about their financial world, the client's financial world. You know, we have to make sure our eyes are open in all different facets here and, and most importantly, empower the client. You and I talked about uh, a couple months ago being a fiduciary for yourself, like, like empowering the client to understand what dollars are doing in various parts of their world and, and what they're exposed to. Like you said, not just running towards real estate just because they hear the guys down the street are making a lot of money because that's the, that's the best and easiest way to lose money is by just blindly chasing it and not know. Yep. So. You know, it, it, if anything comes out of our podcast today, it's it's a little bit more of a, a deeper knowledge about what's going on. Not that we have answers, but that we can keep our eyes open to not only uh, threats but also opportunities. Yep. Right? That, yeah, and that's the thing is, you know, you listen, you listen to us. Don't take what we're saying is, you know, the 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 absolute way way that it is. Okay, because it is it is money markets. Uh, interest rates, it is such a comp, it's so complicated. Okay, looking at, you know, why the Fed is doing what they're doing, they have a completely rational, uh, rational explanation for it. Okay, they have equations that say, if I do this, this is going to happen. If this happens, then I can do this. And this, I mean, they have everything very rationally set, but in the end, okay, they are trying to predict the most irrational thing on the planet, which is human behavior. Right, and it's and it's it's kind of it's kind of a, a, a contradiction of, of sorts, and you know you look at really what happened in 2008. What happened? I know that a lot of people said and predicted. Oh, I predicted this, and this was going to happen. I knew that this, and it's like okay, well, you know, maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but you know, in the end, really, what caused that chaos is that, uh, in you know, emotional individuals, they ex they did certain things, and they did it on a large scale, which caused you know a, ri a ripple effect, if you will. And, and so that's where, you know, really what's going on right now, it's, it's paying attention to the signs, paying attention to, you know, really what, what monetary policy is, what is being said. But as we always state, you know, listen to what's being said, don't come to an absolute conclusion, understand, you know, the different sides of the argument, and then you're able to kind of sit on the edge of the coin and really determine for yourself what is right, uh, what is true, and what is malarkey, right? That's one way to put it. 
we're it's both put... Irish, dude. So I had to throw some. I had to throw some like, <laughs> you know, I Irish slang in there. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely some Irish slang. Patrick, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, even even the best uh, intentions are are mired by just human behavior by itself. I mean, there's there's these thing called cognitive biases that that you know completely fascinate me. I uh, just got done reading through a book called Misbehaving, which is all about behavioral economics, how people consistently and routinely, it's almost predictable that they can be irrational all the time, um, just, just because. And, um, and you even talked to us over the past week or so about, about some stuff you had heard about just human beings being human beings. And, and like you said, at the very end of the day, whether it's Janet Yellen herself, whether it's uh, anybody, any of the other the, the individuals that, that have the levers that they can pull, I mean, they're, they may be trying to do the right thing, but they're really out of arrows. They're really trying to keep the lights on in this party way too long. And who knows if it was human behavior that led them here because they're dealing with a lot of the human behavior on the other end of the, the ledger. Yeah, man, that was a huge point because in the end, you know, I, I, I was at this conference and this, it was hilarious. I mean, guy, guy, has, guy has, been in, has been in financial planning and advising for, for almost 40 years. And he basically said all human beings are – are dogs that talk. <laughs> he didn't, and he said it in a way where it was, it was funny, but he said, listen, we can rationalize, we have cognitive ability that's superior, but in the end, you know, we're human beings and we're wired as, as animals to, to an extent, right? And so we do exercise that kind of animal, non-thinking, non-cognitive behavior, right? And you see it all over the place. And so, and it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, the, the Janet Yellen or, or anybody you know, that, that's in those type of positions of authority somehow does not possess these characteristics that we all do, right? And so you really have to look at, okay, what are they thinking? Why are they doing what they're doing? What are they being told? How are they influenced? And in the end, yeah, they make decisions and they probably do have some you know, superior cognitive ability, but in the end, you, know, you really look at their agenda, what they're trying to do, and maybe we won't know everything. Uh, but I would say that, again, the signal is they've been trying it for so long, it's been tried everywhere, and it's not working, right? With, you know, the, the 15, I think it's up to $17 trillion of, uh, of debt that we have, plus promised obligations leading to $100 trillion, right? It's an insane, and, and you know, what's, uh, you know, what's our, our tax revenue? It's going to take, you know, it's going to take 100 years to get out, to get out of that. Right, and that's and that's not it's that's not even you know that's that's paying principal right now we're not paying any principal we're deficit Gosh, spending fingers. we keep spending and spending you know right now there's just so many things that just don't make any any sense and I'm surprised that it's gone on as long as it has uh, but really you know as we kind of conclude the podcast for today it's you know keep your keep your eyes open right really look at you know look at what what's going on find different opinions. You know, come to a conclusion. Always be willing to change your perspective, change your opinion, because it may be wrong. Okay, mine may be wrong, uh, and or it might be slightly wrong or absolutely wrong. Who, who who knows? But be willing to change, right? Being willing to have an open mind, and from there, you know, you're gonna know hopefully what what to do. But that is where those that were prepared, those that really did know what was coming in 2006 and 2007. Okay, they are the ones that really took advantage of the opportunity and, uh, and did very well. And we're at the kind of precipice of something similar happening. It could be a year, it could be two years, who, who knows? Or, you know, maybe Donald Trump saves the world when he gets, a, you know, well, I'm not saying he's going to, but, you know, maybe the new president, you know, miraculously saves everybody. They, like, you said, like you said, Patrick, you and I don't know what's going to happen. Know, the heck knows? We're like talking about it. <laughs> And, and I would encourage, just as you wrap things up, I would encourage our listeners not to be afraid to call something malarkey when they see malarkey. For sure. Right? Yep. But also, you know, be willing to admit if they were talking about malarkey, they're willing to admit they were. So it's, you know, it's one of those things where I think that's, you know, the, a, a great mindset to have because it shows that, listen, you're pliable, you're always open, you're always open to learning. And that is really where it creates the educated investor. So... All right, Brian. Well, this is the last stuff I wanted to talk about today, and I don't know. It's it's one of those things where um, it's an exciting time to be alive because of all the cool stuff that's happening. But at the same time, it's like, man, what the heck are they doing out out in out in your neck? Of, well, I'm kind of in that neck of the woods right now in in uh, on the East Coast. But East what are they Coast, doing? That's right. Yeah. What are they? What are they? What are they doing? What are they? What are they? Are they really think this is going to happen? You know, who who knows? There's probably lots of you know they're having conversations that. 
But I would say that we're in a fragile time. Keep your eyes open. There's going to be opportunity. And in those opportunities, do not, you know, do not be afraid to do what you think is right. Agreed. <laughs> all right, Brian. Well, it was awesome. Hey, to, uh, we're, yeah, we uh, for all, also for those yeah you didn't know as we wrap this up, uh, we're we're doing we're trying to do a video video podcast. So I kind of have this like really kind of setting uh, set up right now. So uh, if you want to go to YouTube, check out our YouTube channel. We'll have a uh, we'll have this on there. So uh, I think you guys will if you want to see us. I don't you know we were told that that helps, but you know if you want to listen to us, I'm totally fine with that. So. <laughs> Patrick, it's always fun. It is always fun. Uh, excellent podcast that you, you just walked us through here today. And uh, I, apply, I encourage all the listeners, like us on like us on iTunes, right? For sure. Dude, you're, you're like filling in the gaps. Thank you, Like brother. us on iTunes. You know, check us out on uh, Facebook. Check, us up, check out our website, paradigmlife.net. Uh, we're updating it all the time with new content and all that and other stuff. You can sign up for a free class called Infinite 101. We got the whole thing there. Dude, look, I just need to shut my mouth. I see you shutting off, man. <laughs> okay. Patrick, enjoy the rest of your vacation. Okay, you too, Brian. It's good. Uh, it's good to good to see you. Good to hear you. Great conversation. And uh, you know, ditto to everything that Brian just said. All right, everyone. We will. Uh, I'll be back in the office next week. So stay tuned. You've been listening to the Wealth Standard Radio Show, your gold standard in everything financial.